This is the Open University. Hello, Internet. Um, I wanted to do a little video essay today using a, a Korean filter app called B612 um, for the visuals. Uh, but really thinking about uh, Kale Chaika, who's a New Yorker writer who I've noticed um, for a, a few years, actually, as a very interesting social commentator. And uh, he did, a, I think, uh, called Airspace, which was a, an essay about Airbnb and how all Airbnbs um, look the same after a while. Um, how there's a kind of international tyranny of that style. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of Rem Kohlhaas' writing about junk space. But junk space was about shopping centres, airports, air-conditioned spaces, which are generic and seem to sprout in a prefabricated way um, all over the world. Um, this was kind of a, an update uh, to the Airbnb world. And the latest thing he, he published that interested me was... Um, I think it's a, uh, an excerpt from his new book, Filter World, and it was in The Guardian, and it's called, uh, it's part of the Long Read series in The Guardian, The Tyranny of the Algorithm, Why Every Coffee, coffee Shop Looks the Same. Uh, and he's, he's interested in minimalism as a kind of style, not just the aesthetic minimalism of uh, less is more, the sort of conceptual art uh, derived architectural style where you have very concrete, rough-hewn kind of spaces with a, a lot of plants and things in, in cafes, but also uh, the kind of Marie Kondo minimalism of having a simple lifestyle, reducing your needs and your uh, uh, possessions as much as possible. Uh, the connection here that he makes between the algorithm and, and the minimalism style in cafes I find quite interesting. I'm not entirely persuaded by it, um, but he, he's sort of making the argument that um, the insta buy, uh, what they say in, uh, call in Japan insta buy, the Instagrammable spaces, um, have made all coffee shops compete to to become platform ready in the sense that they want to be on Instagram. This this is we've gone from the days when you were actually forbidden to take uh, photos in museums and cafes and things, public spaces in general for reasons of privacy, apparently, to the age in which it's pretty much compulsory. And Asia really led this in the sense that uh, they um, had little guidelines in Japan to spaces where you were encouraged to take the official best optimal photograph of a location. There was one in my local shopping centre, Namba Parks in Osaka, uh, a kind of series of guidelines to the place from which Number Park's architecture, which was modelled on a kind of canyon, a wild space, could be observed the most ideally. Um, so Insta by something I wrote actually an essay about for um, Moose magazine a couple of years ago, uh, the Instagrammable being the new take on the picturesque, the 19th century tradition of the picturesque, the idea that, you know, there is only beauty in certain designated places like waterfalls and mountains and usually tied up in the 19th century with romanticism and with nature but um so you know i'm not um someone who endorses this idea of uh, the single viewpoint i obviously prefer the idea that there is a multi-form kind of beauty out there which it takes a certain kind of um originality of vision to see and it's not going to be the same pictures actually i saw a, a, a photographer's video on youtube recently in which he said uh it is precisely good pictures which are bad pictures you don't want to take good pictures uh, the more you get into photography the more you want to take photos that look in some way wrong uh, in some way awkward in some way startling and surprising and actually he illustrated this with a picture of some mountains uh, rather misty mountain scene which he thought was rather dull and then what he thought was a, an interesting view which was of a little hut <laughs> a cabin cabin porn I guess you could call it uh, in front of the same mountains and he said well this cabin makes it a, a peculiar and uh, less stereotypical view I, I thought the cabin actually was as stereotypical as anything else but but for him it was a, a step away from um, 
convention and from the picturesque. The picturesque is that which already looks like a picture even before you take the picture. So um, Instagram obviously thrives on I'm I'm not on Instagram. I prefer Tumblr because it has tumbleweed. It's kind of a neglected and empty uh, platform with much less uh, algorithmic curation of the feeds. And this is Kyle Chaker's main point is that the algorithm has been responsible for a great uh, reduction in originality and plurality. And we are now all in a sense in filter world, we're slaves of the filter, slaves of the algorithm. Uh, it tells us what to think about, what to look at, and it sticks us in echo chambers where we don't encounter different ways of think thinking and feeling. Um, as far as the in impact on cafes is concerned, I'm, I don't entirely buy it. Uh, oh, I've got a 2024 filter on. <laughs> I don't entirely buy it because uh, I, I spend a lot of time. I mean, if I can just quote his... Um, essay here. He says, the, the tyranny of the algorithm, from the generic hipster cafe to the Instagram wall, the internet has pushed us towards a kind of global ubiquity. And this phenomenon is only going to intensify. So he says, for most of the 2010s, I was a religious user of Yelp, an app for finding and reviewing restaurants and other local businesses. And then he goes on, he often typed hipster coffee shop into the search bar as shorthand, because Yelp's search algorithm always knew exactly what I meant by that phrase. Um, I'm guilty of the same. I, if I go to a new city, I often type uh, barista or hipster, trendy neighbor, you know, this sort of awful language by which you find the kind of cafes that would look good on, in, well, in my case, on uh, Tumblr. Um, but it's it's more about finding, it's about filtration, because as, as Cheka points out, um, these environments filter uh, their clientele, not just their imagery online when you put pictures of the place up online, but also the kind of people who even dare to go in. Um, and I find myself noticing this. I was sitting outside one of my favorite Parisian cafes, uh, Certified, which used to be Arabica, used to be a Japanese cafe. I think it's still Japanese owned, actually. Um, the other day, noticing elderly couples going by and looking in and thinking, hmm, interesting, I didn't know there was a cafe here, or saying to each other out loud, um, it doesn't quite look like it's for us. Well, they didn't maybe say that, but they then passed on. They didn't even think of going in and trying the coffee. It obviously was not, you know, they were filtered they, and they were filtering themselves. They were excising and excluding themselves from the experience of drinking that coffee in that place because they saw a lot of people on laptops. It looked like a co-working space. It almost looked like a private space. Um, go to another filter here. So, um, I and I find sometimes if people do go into those cafes and they look like they're not, going to fit. They're not the right kind of clientele. They're not going to look right. They're not dressed right for it. They're not the right age demographic, the right, uh, you know, um, even social class demographic. Then I kind of think to myself, oh, it's a gaffe. You're, you're, you're doing something wrong. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. If you have any sensitivity at all, you're going to feel out of place in this. It's not for you. You know, sometimes hypocritically, it's people of my own age group. I think I'm the only one my age group allowed in this cafe because I fit in with the young people. Or if I'm in Asia, I think um, I'm the only Western person allowed in this cafe. I want everybody else to be Asian. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I don't spare myself from criticism for these attitudes and their they're kind of snobby attitudes or they're, they're possibly conformist attitudes. Why do I conform to... Um, to Why do I want to conform to things I can't actually conform to, like be young... Um, be a, a an Asian person in an Asian environment, all those things. Maybe I like to, to be the only one who sticks out. But um, I think the filtration point is a good one that uh, you do, there are environments which filter almost as um, mercilessly as the online algorithm filters who gets what content. For You has become uh, the algorithm's way to disguise itself in a kind of kind phrase, or oh, we're doing this for you. This, this note's for you. Um, this feed is for you. It used to be a chronological feed where basically you had chosen which friends you wanted to hear from and you'd just get their chronological posts. Back in the... This was apparently, according to Carl Chaka, this was pre-2016 when social media platforms um, were much friendlier in the sense that you could simply see what your real social contacts posted in a chronological feed. Um, now it's much more nebulous and there's much more advertising, obviously. There's a, 
even a deliberate unfriendliness on on platforms like Instagram and YouTube. If you try to block ads on these platforms, they're now desperately monetizing. So if you try to block ads, they will actually penalize you. Um, They will slow down your connection speed. They will actually block the player. So you have to log out to see their content free as you used to. So it's kind of crunch time. Uh, These, you know, Twitter, as it was uh, now being being made unusable, YouTube being made unusable by their owners um, because if if they can't monetize the platform, you can't use it, basically. So I think um, the algorithm has now, it's, it's not just a helpful butler anymore helping us to see what we want to see. It is actually hindering us uh, from communicating with each other. It might be time to go back to plain old websites like the one I used to... Um, manage in the 90s because there was a delirious freedom where I could I could publish what I wanted and people could read it as they wanted they could use RSS feeds to um, to see what they wanted to see I'm not sure though that in the real world the algorithm is determining environments I certainly noticed I've noticed various successive waves of the real world being um, completely dominated by electronic media and the most striking one for me was when I lived in Osaka in the mid-te- mid-teens of this century and uh, Pokemon Go was a thing and suddenly all these Chinese tourists would descend. I was living near the aquarium and uh, in Osaka and I would see people either stopping their cars on the street outside and the police having to move them on because they were capturing monsters with Pokemon Go. They were interacting with the environment in this weird new way that the algorithm, not the algorithm, the game was determining. There was a park also nearby, a ferry, which would go across to Universal Studios Japan, uh, where obviously there were a lot of monsters to capture. So people would, would be in the park and they would just be looking at their their little flip-up um, game consoles, capturing these monsters or on their phones or whatever. So that was, I'd, since I'd never played this game, I thought, what the hell is going on here? And in a sense, this happened with real environments. When I was in, in 2018 in Malaysia, for instance, I went into cafes in, in Kuala Lumpur and found that uh, there was always an Instagrammable feature. Uh, I think I, I noticed it first in Southeast Asia, but obviously it was also very present in Japan and in South Korea. And it spread to some extent to Europe where there's a feature, like it might be a swinging basket chair or something, in each cafe, which is designed to to be photographed. Um, of course, arguably, the whole of Paris revolves around photographable sites. It's a touristic town. The the Eiffel Tower, you know, whatever, is um, the iconic uh, uh, spot to photograph, and that's always been the case. But I think now micro-environments share this need to be charismatic and to have one recognisable, iconic um, thing that... that signals to the world their charismatic uh, their charm point as as they say in Japan um but i'm not sure because i i don't find um i don't find many cafes actually instagrammable uh or tumblrable <laughs> in my case i mean i actually saw a nice traditional cafe today in belleville in paris uh, which had beautiful old neons kind of art deco neons saying toilets and telephones and which dates it, uh, obviously, the public telephone idea. Um, and just beautifully done in a kind of very charming old style. The waiter thought I was a customer, thought I was going to come in, but actually I was only approaching the windows to take a picture through the window and then continue down the street, um, avoiding having to buy a coffee. I just actually bought a coffee in a much more traditional hipster kind of cafe up the, up the hill. Uh, but I find Paris has very few of these compared with with an Asian city like Seoul, for instance, which has really, really focused on high concept uh, cafes, which can be photographed and have, you know, kind of dry ice rising off fake ponds, uh, mirrors, all sorts of things, really like the photo studios, which are often next door, which again, you don't see in the West. Uh, They haven't really caught on here yet. The idea of there being specific um, f- studios where you can photograph yourself and get little takeaway printed strips of um, Purikura, basically. It's the continuation of the Purikura idea, the print club idea from the 80s Japan, but in a much more elaborate um, way. They have costumes you can put on, you know, you can pose in, in 
elaborate backdrops and things like that. Which, so it's like a whole studio space uh, instead of just a booth, which the Bericura used to be. Um, but, I, but I find the cafe, I'm, I'm not convinced that there is a universal language. Of course, you could say that, uh, you know, if I'm in Barcelona, I might go into very similar cafes to the, the ones you would find in Melbourne. I've never been to the Southern Hemisphere at all, let alone Australia. But uh, apparently the kind of cafe that I go to, it didn't exist, for instance, when I lived in Paris in the 90s. There wasn't that same um, international clientele, for instance, uh, the people speaking, they're always called Megan, and they always say like every third word, and they're working on their laptops. So it is a kind of co-working space as well as a cafe. I think that didn't really exist in Paris. The, the cafes I remember in the 90s living here going to were places like the Café Beaubourg next to the Pompidou Center, the Café de la Gare in, in the Marais. Um, they, were, they were more, or the Rue de Bucci in the left bank, um, various uh, more traditional, you know, fashionable but traditional cafes with cane chairs and street-facing cane chairs. So the theatre of the street was more the thing. And now I suppose you could say the digital street is it's facing the other way. It's the, the digital street of Instagram or of online photography in general is facing the internet. So the, you see people on their devices in cafes, you see people on laptops, on their phones, and also photographing in order to put content, to upload content to the internet. But I do find there's still a huge variety of, of styles of cafes um, in different places, not necessarily local styles, but maybe misapproximations, maybe, maybe its originality resides precisely in the way that cafe owners fail to reach the standards that they think they're, they're aiming for. Uh, the cafe I was in earlier today, I won't name it, um, in Paris, was trying to be a bit like the cafes that I go to in Barcelona, um, that uh, I appreciate very much in Barcelona, but, but failing somehow. It wasn't quite minimalist enough or chic enough or didn't have the right kind of attitude. Uh, people who worked there and who apparently founded it didn't, didn't quite have the same attitude of arrogance and, and, exclu and potential exclusion, a certain threat, which uh, the best cafes have to have, I guess, that... You, you're lucky to be able to be in there and to use those cafes. It's not like they're lucky to get you a custom. There should be a, almost like the bouncer in a nightclub kind of sense that uh, you uh, should be grateful to them. So let's go back to Kyle's um, essay here. These cafes had all adopted... Oh, got a snowman now. These cafes had all adopted similar aesthetics and offered similar menus, but they hadn't been forced to do so by a corporate parent, the way a chain like Starbucks replicated itself. This is quite an important point, actually, that it's often small proprietors with a strong aesthetic sense. Um, I follow on YouTube some um, cafe owners in Hiroshima, for instance, who've just started a very small independent shop, um, the types of places I go to, they're obviously not Starbucks, which is a, an abomination. Uh, the coffee tastes of nothing. Um, and yet, weirdly enough, when Starbucks first started in the 70s and 80s, that was the definition of good coffee. Um, I don't know if it was actually better at the time or if it's, uh, if it's just that we've got much higher standards now. Um, I also, I have various rules that make me even more snobbish, like, for instance, that uh, if cafes serve too much food I, I don't like them anymore if they serve alcohol I absolutely don't like them I don't want a coffee machine sitting next to bottles of spirits and b craft beers or whatever um, that to me is not a proper cafe so my absolute favorite cafe here in Paris is called Cot, and it's just a couple a French man and a Korean woman uh, who actually worked in cafes in Seoul so they're bringing the for me the world's best coffee culture which is currently the, the South Korean coffee culture to Paris. Um, they're aware of, of what the standards are over there. Um, there's another very good one called Substance, but it's more of a, a kind of college for baristas. Um, so what else? If these places were, were also similar, muses Kyle, uh, what were they authentic to exactly? So th this idea of authenticity, which has always been there in rest, the restaurant trade, of authentic ethnic cuisine and uh, cultural asymmetric uh, multiculturalism as someone called it a guy called Kaufman Eric Kaufman once described it that, that uh, um, the restaurants of your own country are not allowed to describe ethnicity although I think that this may have changed since he said this by the way because I think the liberal order that he was reacting against um, 
has has largely been swept away since then. This was a decade or fifteen years ago. He Kaufman talked about asymmetrical multiculturalism, but it, it's the the idea that you're encouraged to celebrate your uh, culture if you are the non-majority culture. If you're not the indigenous culture in a place, you should. Uh, celebrate it. It applies differently in different fields, though. Like if you're serving food, it's much more likely to be locally sourced than coffee, obviously, since coffee in our most Western countries, you can't grow coffee. It has to come from somewhere else. So it's more about the sourcing. But sourcing is a bit like designed in California, manufactured in Taiwan, you know, if you buy an Apple product. Uh, sourcing is, okay, our coffee is designed in a, a rich Western country, but of course it's grown in a poor developing world country. Uh, and that's something that's sort of inevitable. <laughs> so one thing that uh, worried me um, in Kyle's essay, I, I worried that it was an attack on globalized, uh, on the global ideal because there have been so many, recently, so many attacks on uh, the international order that we knew as recently as the noughts, for instance. Um, to say that cafes all over the world look the same has now become a critique, but it was actually a guarantee for some of us who enjoy traveling the world and, and want to find the same kind of cafes wherever we go. I mean, obviously, it's not the, our only experience of otherness <clears throat> because it, it's not otherness, it's sameness. But it's uh, reassuring to have a a little base, which is not the place you're sleeping, which you can go to during the day, which will guarantee a certain aesthetic of plants and music and polished concrete and good coffee that you can rely on. So I personally find, I mean, I don't want everything to become homogenous, but I do want that to be a possibility in many cities that I go to. And I was surprised as recently as 2018 to find, or as long ago as 2018, to find in, um, for instance, Vientiane, uh, the capital of Laos, that there would be a a cafe like that, run actually by Americans overlooking the Mekong River. You could go there and you could have a flat white or a, a, a nice latte and and they'd play a certain kind of music, you know, Joanna Newsome or I don't know, probably slightly less sensitive than that. But uh, And you would... <laughs> Sorry for the distractions here. Um, people would be working on their laptops behind you and uh, you'd get that same experience in, in a place as, as different because you could go straight from there to a, a Buddhist temple or you know you could see the um, the uh, national guard of Myanmar flying around in helicopters, wondering you know probably filming you and wondering what you were up to down by the Mekong River on the sand flats, as happened to me at the time. Um, but there the would be at least the guarantee of a kind of the familiarity of that international global order uh, of the coffee shop. <clears throat> so, but I don't think he is. I don't think um, Cheka is attacking the global experience. Um, there is a kind of critique of that. He also he also talks about those um, painted wings on walls, which I, I'm guilty of having stood between in Seoul uh, when I found them just too irresistible to take one of those gimmicky pictures in which you're transformed into an angel. Um, but uh, so in a, in a way, this is like the kind of it reminds me of the ad busters kind of essays from 20 years ago where they, they'd say, you know, all those kids taking digital pictures, they should be flinging stones instead, you know, and fomenting the revolution. Um, honestly, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with there being hip cafes. And in a sense, they're never quite hip enough. It's funny, the Berlin cafe that uh, Cheka mentions in this Guardian long read piece is the Hallisches, uh, the place called Hallisches, um cafe in um uh in Kreuzberg which um I'd never been to but it looks very unlike the kind of cafes you'd expect him to be describing it's a very german space actually with very arched um appointed arches and it's a, an old 19th century german revival building which is specifically architecturally making specific references to um a great um, 19th century german style and, and nationalism and unification of Germany. So it's not that kind of minimalist, reduced style, which is itself a reference to all the other minimalist cafes across the world, a fraternal reference to those, but also uh, a, an occlusion of reference to uh, local specific cultural things. You want there to be a space which doesn't make local references, because there is 
you know, we, we, we live in an age of mistrust of the global and especially of borderless population movements. But actually, maybe there should also be a deep suspicion of the local. Um, you know, that is the, the problematic area for, for me anyway. The, the idea that we shouldn't um, know anything about other ways of living and other cultures and we should be stubbornly local in our references and in our vernacular styles of architecture and cafes and shops and whatever it is in our cities they should all be local you know i i don't i don't mind calling myself a scottish nationalist if it comes to um scotland having the opportunity to declare an affinity with the european union for instance rejoin the european union but i don't want there to be a specifically very scottish very insular culture emerging from any hypothetical um independence we do gain I hate the algorithm. Everyone hates the algorithm. Um, Cheka is quoting a cafe owner saying um, her goal was to build something that did not exist at that moment in Bucharest, a space that was at least aesthetically non-local. So yeah, this is a this is a good point. People wanted to make international spaces and that, that was a kind of escapism, but it was also a connection to something real which was simply physically distant and was less distant than it had been because of jet travel, but also because of the internet, because you could look online and see. I mean, I follow a lot of lifestyle blogs about cafe hopping, either about cafe creation, like the couple in uh, Hiroshima, or someone like Carrie Cakes in Seoul, cafe hopping. She realizes that um, some of her content is going to be about young adult fiction. Some of her content is going to be about her own personal life and things she's going through. Uh, some of it's going to be motivational, some of it's going to be Squarespace uh, sponsorship. But um, the big hook for me and for many other people is, hey, let's go to a cafe in Seoul and uh, just hang out and relax and enjoy a beautiful aesthetic experience and a good imaginary cup of coffee. Even if we're drinking Nescafe at home, it's nice to watch that. Watch someone in a uh, one of the top flight cafes of this type. So... Pursuing Instagram Instagrammability is a trap, says Kyle Shaker. The fast growth that comes with adopting a recognizable template, whether for a physical space or purely digital content, gives way to the daily grind of keeping up posts and figuring out the latest twists of the algorithm. Which hashtags, memes or formats need to be followed? Um, certainly online, I think people do feel those pressures. Um, I feel the opposite pressure, which is that an unpopular platform is, is one I'll very happily embrace. Um, even if it means a sense of neglect. Uh, but I think I'd probably be the same if I ran a cafe in the real world. I'd probably want to make a, a quirky variant on... And this is where we have to talk about the two principal qualities of music, which are repetition and variation. They've always been. This is You need um, a theme in music. You need a key uh, established, you know, in tonal music anyway. Um, but then you also need variation, otherwise it's boring. So even a, a piece like Discrete Music by Brian Eno has a repetition, a lot of repetition, but, but variation as well, which in his case was created by having tape loops uh, running at different speeds, but with um, harmonies, potential harmonies uh, in place because they were spaced um, in uh, third intervals usually. So um, there is repetition and variation in every genre. And when I first read this, Kyle Checker article, I thought about, um, you know, parodies you could make of his argument saying, oh, all these cave people with their cave paintings, they all do the same type of environment or all these churches that you find, you know, these Gothic churches, whatever churches all have a kind of stereotypical layout. And there's the nave, there's the pulpit, there's the, the seats and whatever. There's the stained glass. You know, of course, there are these repetitions, but there are also variations in every place you go to. It's it's the 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 differences within the format, the formula that are interesting. So I think that this is also applying to cafes, that once you get used to the um, the staples of the genre, you can really appreciate the originality of the variations that you find. Um, and I continue to, to search for, you know, interesting new cafe environments in every city I go to. And of course, they all have something in common, but they also all have subtle and interesting differences. So um, the sameness has a way of compounding is the last sentence in this Guardian excerpt anyway from the book Filter World. Um, I don't think we're quite at the nightmare scenario yet, which he's implying, which is that uh, a, 
kind of algorithmic influence seeps out into the real world and destroys the beauty of the variety of our daily experience in the real world. I don't think we're, we're there yet. I think there is enough subtle variation in our experience. And if there isn't, you know, you can find it. You can find quirky places. I know that people hipper than me, um, like uh, Anne Death in Seoul, t- took me to a very quirky um, cafe f- run by a friend of hers, which was full of, you know, toy robots and weird kind of collectibles. And, you know, it was obviously the the, f- the food of obsession. So as long as people are somewhere, little cafe owners, little content creators, whatever, are obsessed by something compulsively, there will be interesting things for us to consume and interesting places for us to visit. That's all I wanted to say today. Thank you for listening. Open University.